This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on the EAB University page of the www.emeraldashbor.info website. These webinars are made available through a grant from the U.S. Forest Service. Thank you for attending everyone today. And Rachel, you can unmute your microphone and begin your presentation. All right, thank you so much for inviting me to present today. I'd like to go over some information that may be familiar to um, most of you, but just in case we have new people within the area, I'd like to uh, go over the ba obligatory background information on emerald ash borer beetle and ash so that everybody is caught up to date just in case you're new to this information. You can see our emerald ash borer beetle is a bright green insect that's no longer than a penny. And it's um, originally from Asia, co-evolving um, with Asian ash, and was brought into America, um, located via in southeast uh, Michigan near Detroit, uh, likely from cargo shipping containers. Uh, the larva of the EAB beetle is something that develops underneath the bark of the ash tree and so is uh, easily eating away at the um, and most important part of the ash tree, the cambium layer, which reduces its ability to process nutrients um, throughout its system. Overall, EAB um, larvae cause the more, more death blow to ash than the beetle itself, although the beetles are able to um, pr produce many eggs and prefer to, to lay them on um, solely ash trees and are more prone to be um, looking for larger ash trees that may um, be more stressed and have crevices in the bark to allow them to position their eggs in a, in a good manner. This has uh, started back in the early 2000s and our picture here of the map is uh, the most up-to-date information on emeraldashboard.info locations that EAB has been detected. And you can see how it's spread across the eastern region of North America, that being the main um, section of the US that all different ash species reside. Um, there are a few different species that reside in a, a few different locations and EAB has been moving steadily across the area um, since 2020 mostly been expanding in the um, southern regions like Louisiana, Georgia, and a few more um, over in Colorado. All the different kind of information that you would like to know about emerald ash borer can be found at emeraldashborer.info, and we'll be looking at, um, you can find many different things on there that you can look at do, uh, to research maps, homeowners guides, etc. The green ash has been um, one of the trees that I'm gonna be focusing on today. Although EAB can attack any um, species of ash. And so this just gives you some examples of the different types of ash trees that we, we find across our region, especially uh, the Midwest region where I've been working in Michigan and Ohio. The green ash is one that um, we were able to find a lot of in those initial areas, um, it, it's a white ash as well, but um, in those in initial natural areas of Southeast Michigan and Northwest Ohio. And so to give you the full story, we'll sort of start at the beginning in those locations and move on to try to understand where we're trying to progress with, with the future of ash. We have, um, that beginning timeline back in 2000, 2002 is when it really started to be evident in Northern Ohio. And uh, the between 2002 and 2008 is when we observe the uh, peak mortality of ash uh, from that initial wave of EAB infesting the area. Our graph here by Kathleen Knight is of one of her plots in Northwest Ohio. And it shows the percentage of ash trees within those clots that were 
greater than 10 centimeters diameter at breast height and how they progressed in their health over time. So between within those first five or six years is when the majority of the uh, larger ash had um, perished from EAB. And we had been noticing that similar progression happening um, across Southeast Michigan and um, outwards in other areas of Ohio. In this area, um, again, green ash was the primary species that was found in, in um, Northwest Ohio. We have a lot of floodplain forests where we had been tracking ash. I was a part of the crew that was helping Kathleen Knight with uh, tracking ash, and she was also recording information on what kind of things we would um, view within forest changes across time. So for example, we have in the left side of the screen, a picture of wildwood uh, after uh, the EAB's primary um, mortality of ash had occurred. So you end up with larger canopy gaps, more floodplain um, plant material growing and invasive plants invading. You can see some canary reed grass in the background and a lot of dead woody debris from ash. The um, lingering ash story uh, goes along with this. In those primary um, plots that were set up across Ohio being the locations where initial um, mature ash trees were still found to be alive after this peak mortality in 2008. So while we saw like in the center picture, canopy gap openings and a, a lot of those plant species on the ground in this picture are ash seedlings. We weren't expecting, um, like in the picture on the right, uh, these larger ash trees still alive after EAB had hit um, all of the forest monitoring plots so severely. And so with that, uh, the, the search for more of these um, larger trees, which we defined as being larger than 10 centimeters diameter at breast height, were looked for in order to assess, is this a, a, a very specific rare happening or is it something that occurred more across the um, entire region? We first started at the Northwest Ohio location where the initial trees were found. The Oak Openings region in Northwest Ohio is one of the areas of more um, higher biodiversity of Ohio. And so we thought, well, uh, let's take a look and see what we can find. Between 2010 and 11, we found a lot of, um, of these trees across that floodplain forest. And across time, we were able, uh, over the years, uh, we searched in other locations and were able to find other lingering ash trees to keep track of. Uh, the ones specifically in Northwest Ohio were all tagged in, and I was uh, helping, assisting with keeping track of their health over time. But with, uh, with this being not just a special rare occurrence that was only happening in Northwest Ohio, the lingering ash trees were then um, noted and trying to be kept track of by the Forest Service um, and also trying to be looked at to understand what was different about these individuals. And the um, uh, Cook Research Lab and the Northern Research Station was able to come up with a, a way to test for the resistance of EAB and these lingering ash. And currently today we have uh, criteria that we look at when we get reports of a lingering ash tree to help us assess if it's ready to be considered for uh, resistance testing to EAB. A lot of times we had seen in, North, uh, in Michigan and Ohio, high mortality of ash in that very short window of time. And so we wanted to wait at least two years after most of those ash trees had perished before labeling this tree as potentially resistant because of uh, it maybe just being one of the last trees to go within that um, system. But over the uh, years with the way that EAB has progressed differently across other states and different types of forests, we've adjusted this so that if there's a slower ash mortality occurring within a system, 
we can still label some of those trees as lingering ash if it's been long enough with that kind of mortality occurring. All of the trees that are put through resistance testing are from natural woodland areas. We, we don't want to make sure these uh, trees have any special advantage from um, being taken care of on the landscape, whether that's with uh, mowing around them, watering, or applying you know, pesticides. These trees that uh, we look for resistance are all um, natural and have been um, present within the system since EAB's peak infestation. So a lot of times we have a trunk size limitation on what we're looking for as well. And the canopy should still leaf out and be relatively healthy during the growing months. Although there can still be damage like from EAB showing issues with um, woodpeckers or EAB exit holes, uh, but still have a healthy canopy. We like to have those uh, trees kept track of. And um, over time, uh, we've been the Forest Service has been able to quantitatively test um, just how resistant these lingering ash individuals are. Primarily, we take samples from them and clone them to allow to have multiple clones for testing. And the bioassay looks like this. Um, in, in retrospect, just, just, it's just shortening up as much as possible, where we have the clones of the lingering ash trees grown to a specific um, height so that EAB eggs can then be added onto them directly. These are then um, uh, allowed to progress over eight weeks of growth to see what the tree has done um, against the EAB larvae in their system. So for example, at the end of the eight weeks, uh, what we do is we need to remove the bark layers a little at a time to see where the larva had progressed. And those that uh, don't do so well end up having the larva come to full term. So you can hopefully see within the circle a little uh, black spot that's the head of the EAB larva. And in the more resistant individual in the circle, you see that dark harsh line, and that's the feeding line of the larva that has been um, hardened over by the cells of the ash tree to um, kill the larva and keep it from doing any more damage. This is a lot of work for the, um, the research lab um, at the Northern Research Station. They have multiple eggs that get attached to each of, of the clones. Uh, as you can see in this picture here, there's multiple little white pieces of paper on the tree that adds enough EAB stress to the tree to understand what kind of response it will have to uh, um, the EAB larva attached to it. All of these trees seen in the picture are what they go, just a portion of what they go through each year and quantifying the um, resistance of different lingering ash trees uh, to EAB. And they found that uh, the lingering ash have varying um, ways that they react to EAB larvae. Some of the lingering ash are able to kill significantly more larvae than the susceptible control green ash that they put through this same um, experiment. And these lingering ash can kill as much as some of the Asian ash that have also been put through this EAB bioassay. The, uh, the Forest Service Lab has also seen that some of the lingering ash do kill more larvae than the control ash, maybe not significantly. And, um, and some don't kill any larvae at, at all. So there's a gradient as to how resistant any one lingering ash tree is to EAB and not really a switch that, that makes it either completely or not resistant to EAB. But even in those uh, individuals that may not kill all of the larvae, uh, some, some lingering ash significantly reduce the larval weight at the end of the period, thus indicating some stress that it's putting on the EAB itself and their probability of surviving. Over the years, the our research lab has been able to take a look at um, lingering ash individuals and uh, grow them up to maturity so that they can start 
uh, crossbreeding different lingering ash individuals. And they have noticed that the offspring of uh, these crosses, some of, some of them, not all of them, will end up performing better than their parents in this EAB bioassay. And it's just uh, very something I, I'd like you to know. They've been working very hard at the Cook Lab for a long time on making sure that they are able to assess uh, specifically just how well each of these individuals and their offspring are able to fight against EAB. This was all going on while I was just, as a side note on a storyline here, they were working on this while I was assisting uh, Kathleen Knight with uh, tracking um, lingering ash individuals across Northwest Ohio. And when I heard about this information from them, I was interested in understanding um, for my doctoral research, the the specific population of uh, aftermath forest ash that were left over from um, that primary peak EAB mortality event. And so um, I'm gonna go a little bit into what that was about and what I learned from that. With population modeling, what you're doing is taking uh, the quantitative estimates of survival, growth, and fecundity from the different life stages of your the particular species you're looking at to then um, uh, use a software program to run it through the system and understand what the estimated viability would be over a certain amount of time. In my case, I was using just over the next 50 years to get of us a short uh, peak in the window of what's to come. With uh, population modeling on any species, you can use a variety of data sources to come up with these estimates of survival, growth, and fecundity. With the information that we had already from the Forest Service keeping track of this um, particular population of ash in Northwest Ohio, I was able to come up with survival and growth data from each of, uh, from this specific population while also assessing what kind of other information was found in um, scientific literature so that we get uh, the best estimates possible. Now, when you do population modeling, you can just assess what's currently happening in that particular population and assume that nothing will change over time. But for me, I also wanted to change the survival fun fecundity and growth um, estimates based on what our expected outcomes would be from particular events that might occur over the next 50 years. And that allows you to model under different circumstances, although you have to understand that we're assuming that these rates are going to change based on um, certain expectations. What we get out of population modeling is we understand what kind of growth rate a certain population has, what its abundance um, on average could be over time, and the percent chance of that population going extinct or having a severe decline over the number of years you run the model for. So with our ash tree um, population in Northwest Ohio, I broke down the life cycle of ash um, and hopefully this graphic helps explain it. You end up, um, because uh, you have ash growing at a certain rate, the life cycle is then broken up into first year uh, germination and then broken up based on the size of the tree at, uh, at DBH. So you have the smallest uh, saplings, less than one centimeter a group, of, uh, a life cycle group of those between one and 10 centimeters DBH, um, and then 10 to 20, and then 20 plus uh, centimeters diameter at breast height where I was assuming that just those that were the largest and most mature were able to successfully reproduce. And that's what the F5 is there, the annual fecundity or number of seeds that I estimated would be able to germinate within that first year. So with this, we have survival um, equaling P. So what numbers uh, P would equal the survival percentage for that group and then it would also need a growth probability of growing into the next stage. So it's impacted 
Um, and the calculations are based on all of these different um, probability uh, numbers that are found either from the data that um, taken on the ground or also can be supplemented with things from the literature. Like for example, the, the fecundity in our part needed to be supplemented by information from the literature. And so we're extrapolating these numbers based on different assumptions. Here you can see the data that I have is based on the aftermath forest. So 2010 to 2017 in Northwest Ohio. And you can um, get a look at how we end up having different survival amounts for the different life stages. For example, the 20 plus centimeter DBH had a, a probability of survival of 53% um, each year. And what I did was also put in initial abundances that were from the local survey data, which ended up being just about a thousand trees to start the population simulation with. And as the software carries out this uh, simulation of the population abundance over time, you have a number of replications occurring within the computer so that you get an average abundance over time, which then they can do average expectations of uh, decline or extinction as well. In order to make sure that things are a little bit more uh, like it would happen in nature, we put a ceiling carrying capacity on this extrapolation in the computer so that it cannot go over a certain threshold of abundance. So that was based on historical numbers of ash within this one population. And we also add deviations, uh, standard deviations to the um, different uh, variables of uh, probability of survival and growth to the next stage. And that allows us to experience in the simulation the randomness that could occur in the environment on a whole. So what I want to show to you show you is what I um, got results of as uh, as the baseline population. So as if nothing would change from this baseline, these baseline parameters, except for those the normal stochasticity or environmental variation that we would expect to happen. And then also I changed the numbers um, and added into the system a catastrophe. So the software allows for different catastrophes to occur. And in this case, our catastrophe is EAB pressure and not any other sort of different environmental catastrophe. And also to assess different management um, um, impacts on uh, such a uh, population that might have more EAB um, issues in the future. I also had one where resistant seedlings or saplings uh, were added to the population to assist in its persistence. So uh, the, the table here shows you the kind of numbers that were outputted by the um, population extrapolation. And the baseline scenario is the one um, where we had some assumptions that the, the trees would be able to produce a certain amount of seeds. And I think that might uh, be one of the parameters that made it uh, very likely that this baseline population would increase in abundance and not have a probability of extinction. So it, it's important when uh, you look at uh, other people's modeling scenarios, you understand that, that some of these numbers can be switched and change so that in the future we can have a more reliable forecast. The catastrophe event uh, is something where EAB, uh, I was assuming that it would impact the trees similarly to its peak infestation rate, which means that if the computer simulated a, and it popped up a, a, light, a chance that it would have a bad year, the survival would be reduced by 90%. And that is something that um, shows you that it's a very bad scenario, worst case scenario in my mind, because in most cases, pest outbreaks um, the second time around aren't as nearly as um, impactful as the primary peak infestation due to the lack of um, uh, resources for that pest the second time around. So uh, think of the catastrophe information here as a worst case scenario where he, this one population just keeps get, uh, having the probability of having really bad years from EAB. 
And with that, that means over the next 50 years, there's a almost 80% probability of extinction um, and definitely a, a prob high probability of having a 50% decline in population numbers. The, because this is showing a worst case scenario, I also adjusted that uh, uh, survival reduction by 40%. So that we call the reduced catastrophe, something that we assume might be more likely to happen than a, uh, a very intense um, uh, reduction in survival uh, the second or third time around from, by EAB. And with that, you see uh, if, if EAB is not impacting the survival as much, we get a um, much better outcome where probability of extinction is now only 30% and we have a higher final total abundance. And finally, um, to understand what restoration um, could do for a population that is experiencing really bad EAB symptoms, um, you, we have uh, uh, our final two scenarios where we theoretically added 400 trees to the initial 1,000 uh, trees in the population that have um, uh, ash tree survival and growth based on historic um, ash populations. So um, we would assume that the restored trees are resistant enough to EAB to grow and survive as they did historically. This also um, helped tamper out the extre extremity, uh, the extreme um, uh, probability of extinction with the EAB catastrophe added to the system and shows that uh, there are things we can do that can help tamper the effects of EAB. With, uh, with more information uh, as time goes on, uh, these um, survival and growth um, estimates can easily be switched out and new models can be run to understand um, better what the future holds for ASH. With that, I'd like to get into a little bit more of what the, uh, the Forest Service has uh, completed and how it all gets involved in um, their ASH breeding program for resistance to EAB. Um, as we talked about previously, it is going to involve monitoring ash, especially the lingering ash, to help us with knowing um, uh, better, get a better idea of which ones to select and clone for testing. And uh, with that, the testing allows us to put together individuals that have more resistance through hand pollination via uh, and and that allows for uh, us to have um, better offspring in the future. Although that's, all of this is uh, very time and labor intensive, but it also is in need of, of increasing and replicating across the ash range in Eastern North America so that we can end up with um, uh, ash trees that are more EAB resistant but that are also adapted to the different areas of Eastern North America. Whereas currently we're working with a lot of uh, lingering ash that are from the, the Midwest region, uh, specifically Michigan and Ohio. And this allows us to then outplant these individuals to see how they do uh, over time. So here in this picture, we have um, the Holden Arboretum's ash clone field test uh, from last year. And these uh, green and white ash here are planted to assess how they're going to handle it being out in the environment over time. And if they all do well and are able to survive, even though um, EAB is still present in this area, it's likely that they're, uh, they're, they're going to be able to form into an open pollinated seed bank. And we can then test those, uh, those seeds to see if they are still holding up and having the same type of resistance to EAB. So this is just a little bit of a breakdown to go over what I was just referring to in our um, Holden um, clone field test. It was brought about in this way and in this breeding strategy is what, what the Cook Lab at the Forest Service is using 
where those lingering ash trees that they have been able to raise up to maturity have been hand pollinated together. And there are many different crosses between the different uh, lingering ash that are available. Then uh, testing the, uh, the seed that grow from, from those crosses and being able to pick out the best progeny from them in order to, again, hand pollinate those together and create individuals that are um, the second generation that can be planted out into orchards to assess um, further over time. With this, uh, it's, it should allow us to produce seeds that have an increased defense against EAB, although it could be a varying de defense based on, on which ones are uh, together. But all, always, it helps to retain genetic diversity and adaptive capacity for these trees so that in the future, if there are other challenges put up against them, they will still have uh, that going for them. And which leads me to just bring up uh, the Great Lakes Space and Forest Health Collaborative that I'm coordinating for the uh, US Forest Service, uh, American Forest and Holden Forest and Gardens, which first started this initiative. We're a GLRI grant-based program and are focusing on this, these activities that help us with pest and disease resistance breeding. So, with ash being one of our species of concern, we're also looking into how this similar process can work for American beech and Eastern hemlock. Uh, just FYI, for American beech here, we have a picture of the new, uh, new beech leaf disease that's affecting them, uh, which causes intervenal banding. Uh, the cells are disrupted by a non-native nematode get, that gets uh, in within the leaves. Also, uh, besides hemlock woolly adelgid, which you see here in the picture on the hemlock, uh, that we also do have elongated hemlock scale that's impacting eastern hemlock as well. And so these are the kinds of pests and diseases that we, uh, we are focusing on at the moment, not to say that we wouldn't be adding other issues as well later down the line. The Forest Health Collaborative and the way I, I help coordinate it is to make sure that there's a network of partners that uh, know about us and know that we're here to help share resources and tasks and updates on how to, to um, uh, learn more about the pests and diseases that are affecting the trees and start monitoring and um, doing activities that will help with uh, breeding for resistance in the future. So what I will, I, you can reach out to me. I always keep partners up to date on what kind of research and uh, activities, breeding activities that are going on with these species, and also can be called upon to help train partners on these activities. Uh, first and foremost, this year, we're ramping up to have a lot of trainings for citizen scientists and landowners and um, people who would like to help with monitoring for lingering species within their neck of the woods. Um, but I also can help with all stages of these breeding activities, propagations, and growing. To help give a, a little boost, hopefully, to our monitoring of these trees, I'd like to remind everybody that the TreeSnap app is available for reporting lingering ash trees. The TreeSnap app is a free app for your phone, and it has more than just ash trees in there. Each individual tree species listed has a, a group of uh, of partners that are working on projects related to that tree. And uh, really, it really helps them to be able to have data from, from individuals who go out and record it. Um, US Forest Service and I use this to search for reported ash trees via this app. And I can then um, uh, confirm uh, that they're lingering ash and uh, can have them reported to be looked at more closely for being used in the breeding program after um, going through the EAB bioassay. And this app is pretty um, simple and useful. It has background information on the tree. It lets you uh, pull up images of what we're looking for when these questions are asked so that it, it can be pretty straightforward and, and easy to use. But per usual, there's always um, 
uh, help um, within the apps if you have questions. And then another outreach program that had been has been happening and hopefully can be expanded to different areas is the managing and monitoring ash projects, the MAMA projects. There, they were started out in uh, New York by the Ecological Research Institute. So you can read all about them at monitoringash.org. But what they did when EAB was um, uh, in this timeline, EAB was just about to start spreading into New York. They created three different projects that you can add to your um, uh, to your projects in the Anic Data app, which is an app that allows you to search for projects to help out with um, in your area. So there was Ash EAB surveys, which they used to help find at EAB when it started to uh, infest the New York region, monitoring plot networks projects, which allowed uh, yourself, professionals, or a group of citizen scientists to create ASH-only plots um, in natural areas to record EAB symptoms over time, which then, of course, allowed them to assess when ASH tree mortality had hit a certain point was it okay to start looking for these lingering ash that had made it through the most difficult time um, of EAB infestation? And so that uh, really helped them learn a lot more about what was occurring in the, the New York area and is now being used in Vermont as well. If you think that this is something that is a good idea for your area to use, feel free to contact me or those involved at monitoringash.org to um, get it started in your neck of the woods. And in summary, I just like to say that while we have these invasive pests like EAB that can create severe problems for trees like ash, especially when we have this um, singular tree impact, monitoring um, this across time has really allowed us to observe natural selection occur um, at its at its best and, um, and was relatively a little bit easier, I would have to say, for ash since EAB had impacted it on such a quick time scale. We're not always so lucky with the way that pests impact trees. But um, I'd like to say that the uh, geneticists that were working on all of this information over the past 20 years were invaluable to what we've, what we've been able to make progress on. And there's, uh, hope in our future forecast for ash, but uh, with, with the different ways that we have integrated pest management, working on the problem with um, breeding for resistance to EAB being one of those tools in the toolbox, we still need more lingering ash to be found so that we can uh, make sure we're gathering as much uh, genetic diversity and variation as possible, especially those uh, minute differences across uh, different regions of Eastern North America and uh, more ash breeding programs across the region is what we're hoping to, to amp up and increase for uh, the future of ash to, uh, to be prosperous, uh, especially in, in the restoration breeding aspect of integrated pest management. So thank you for listening. Um, here's my email, the website to the Forest Health Collaborative and those other um, websites to the apps that can assist with monitoring and finding um, lingering trees. Thank you, Rachel. Um, we do have some um, questions. Have some questions. Let's see here. Um, Sky oh. Stevens asks, would you incorporate climate change into the current model? For uh, the climate change situation, we have uh, a tree atlas um, online webpage where individuals from the Forest Service have already um, worked on assessing the uh, climate change issue for multiple different tree species, mostly based on uh, where they are now and where we expect them to live in the future. And uh, this kind of locational information is important, um, but it, any, there would need to be a specific climate change event that would be impacting um, the survival of uh, or growth of ash that we, we could quantitatively have before we can input it into, um, into the model. And I haven't 
had time to look at that yet. All right, thank you. Um, what, how are ash species being cloned, Clay asks, via grafting? If so, what rootstock is typically used? Yes, thank you. I didn't, I, I wanted to just use the word clone because I didn't know what kind of audience I would have today, but grafting is the way that uh, we're to, they're doing that with the Forest Service. So uh, with that, you have your, your branch sample from your lingering ash tree being added to a uh, seedling. So the rootstock and the rootstock that we use is green ash which is still being produced at some um, state nurseries for us so that there is um, uh, seed, seedlings available for grafting and making those clones. All right, Chuck has two questions for you. Is imidacloprid T and O T two F effective as a bark spray? Also, has anyone heard of a video recorded by Martha Stewart about her failed efforts to stop EAB at her Connecticut farm. <laughs> no, but now I'm going to have to look that up. Um, I, I haven't heard of that. And imidacloprid is one of the pesticides that are used for EAB. Um, bark sprays is not typically what is, is seen for that. Um, and imidacloprid is usually applied by a a nursery or a forestry professional um, with injections at the base of the tree. Um, there are um, some other pesticides that are uh, mixed with water for a soil drench that is more available for over-the-counter um, people who want to try and help their ash tree in their yard. But still, it's um, definitely something to get some outside advice on for your particular location if you're interested in that. And also the EA um, emerald ash info page does have a section on uh, a couple of different sections on not only the research with imidacloprid and other pesticides, but also um, information for homeowners as well on that. So hopefully um, going to that web page will help you answer any particular questions you have. All right, um, Andrew asks, can you further describe the mechanisms of the defense? Is it all about hardening the galleries? Uh, no, it's not all about hardening the galleries. If that was the only thing that was happening, we would probably, um, that would be much more simple. So, so there's a couple of different things. Uh, they've, they've, Forest Service re and other researchers have found that there's a little bit of a leaf taste preference to beetles, uh, but mostly they're just looking for the largest leaves, so the biggest and the biggest trees. Uh, with, uh, with the different chemical aspects going on within the ash tree, I'm not uh, privy to the specifics on it. it. It's not my area of study, but there, there are some cases where the egg will hatch, but the larvae will not be able to um, uh, chew its way underneath the bark. Uh, there's uh, that situation where the larva end up weighing less than other larva. Um, uh, and so there's uh, something going on there with how the tree is is treating the, the larva. But the the most it's one of the um, it's one of those easier, more common things to be able to show you guys as to how how it fights against EAB. So that's why I use that picture. OK, Tom asks, how much do we understand about the mechanism of resistance? Is it a chemical difference between resistant and non resistant individuals? I would say that uh, there is still some t some more work to, to be done on that, to understand it a little bit more specifically, especially linking phenotypes to genotypes and, and things like that. Um, but as I said, that's not, that's not my area of expertise. So I'd have to um, direct you more to uh, other individuals to answer that question. Okay, and um, just so everyone knows, her contact information will be in an email that you are sent tomorrow if you have more questions as well. Um, Sarah says she's attempting to create an account on the TreeSnap app. It will not let me saying I don't have internet connection, which I do. It seems to be app specific. 
as all other web features on my device, including apps, are working properly, who might I contact about this? I believe if you're uh, if you're on your phone and working through that, then um, on the on the phone is usually where I go to the the app store to download it. And if it's not working properly there, um, that might be a phone situation. But the website should have a, a little question mark up in the corner. And I assume that that would be the location to, to look for help with that. Um, and, and hopefully that will help you out. It's almost more of a tech question. <laughs> Sometimes, definitely, yeah, definitely, and I and I believe on that and that web page there. I can't pull it up just at the moment, but I believe there's a place where you can try to where you, there's an email to contact them directly. Okay. Um, Jonathan asks, do you do you see the model being different for different regions, say ash trees in the Great Lakes area compared to the southeast U.S. Absolutely. So like I said, my population modeling extrapolation was specifically for uh, one population in Northwest Ohio. And, uh, and so I, I would expect that there's going to be differences between um, different species of ash and where they're located at. But by having um, a, a bit of the groundwork laid out with what kind of uh, life stages you have and um, basic information uh, that we know from the literature on ash, some of that can be useful for others who are looking to do population modeling for their location. Okay. Um, this question, thank you for the interesting presentation. Besides the EAB bioassays, are there any chemical or genetic investigation done from the lingering ashes to understand the mechanisms behind why some of them can kill the larvae, why some reduce the larval weight? Yes, I believe so. But um, at the moment with the way things have worked uh, across time and, and uh, energy put towards a lot of this, um, I, I don't think all of it is published yet. Um, some of the research has been done and then some of the research is still continuing to be worked on um, in order to break down um, the specific details uh, with ASH. Okay. Um... Andrea asks, Rachel, have you run your predictive model using supplemented sapling or seedlings with increased resistance to EAB? Do you have an estimate of the degree of resistance needed to achieve a high likelihood of long-term persistence of the population? We probably don't need complete resistance, but how low can we go and get significant improvement survival of ash in woodlands? Yeah, I so the one that I showed within the presentation today was from uh, the information that we knew on how young trees uh, reacted and lived in plantations before EAB entered the country. So being able to get some information from the um, from, for example, the the clone field test on those individuals to see how they survive. Uh, that will uh, allow me to get a baseline for, for those uh, saplings or seedlings. And then I could uh, reduce their, their different parameters to understand how low we could go. That's a really good question and something that I, I can pursue in, in the future. All right, thank you. Um, Emily says, the news on resistance is good news. Over time, one will have to show if the resistance is durable and stable as with any resistance program in forest trees, eventually knowing the mechanisms, et cetera, will be useful. Thank you for that. Um, I am not seeing any more questions at this point. Um, again, thank you so much, Rachel, for your um, willingness to provide all this information. We do get asked a lot about this question about the resistance of ash and, and what's being done and how that's all going. So this is great that you were able to um, enlighten us and bring us up to speed on this. Again, folks, this is being recorded and you will be able to see it later on 
the eab.info page on the same EAB University page, um, there will be a link to that that will have the play the recorded webinar button on it so you can be see this. So with that, folks, um, again, Rachel will, uh, her email and contact info will be on the letter you'll be receiving tomorrow, uh, email. And thank you so much again, Rachel, and everyone have a good day. I'm going to close the webinar now. Thank you.